Good morning, Fusion Church. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, as you know, I pastor in Pleasantville, a church called Crossroads. I've been there uh, 21 years. My dad was the pastor before me. I've been in ministry for 30 years. Uh, let me just tell you, Pastor Brendan is a very dear friend of mine, and uh, he didn't pay me to say this, but you have an awesome pastor. Amen. You do. No, you really do. Amen. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love, I love him and his family. They're good people. And um, so you're in a series called God at Work. And Pastor Brendan asked me last week if I would jump in and just share my testimony. And uh, I want to do that. God at work, God at work. But let's begin with praying and asking God just to meet us here in a special way. Father God, we thank you so much for today. What a glorious day you have created. And now we get to, to, to hear from you, from your word. Would you speak to us today? God, would you encourage and challenge your people through this testimony, through these verses, through your word today? We give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Good. So your pastor asked me to share a little bit about my testimony. But before we do that, um, I have a question for you. Here's the question. Here's the question. It'll come up in a second. It wasn't that funny. What is the one thing that links every human being on earth? Anyone that's ever lived, anyone alive today, and anyone in the future, what's the one thing that links us all together? Here it is. You ready? Suffering. You ever thought about that? Every person that has ever lived, every person alive today, will experience some kind of suffering, some kind of pain, death, a, a, a loss of a loved one. All of us experience some kind of suffering in this world. And so I want to talk today about God at work in suffering. Because I don't know if you know this, but God works through suffering. God works through pain and struggle. It's what he does. February 2nd, 2017. It was a Thursday. I'll never forget it. I would awake from my colonoscopy to find my life would change forever. I was a bit groggy, and the nurse came to me, and she said, listen, we called your wife because the doctor wants to speak to both of you. And how many know that it's trouble? So right then and there, my wife and I go into this very cold, tasteless room. The doctor says this, his words, not mine. We discovered a huge tumor in your colon. What's the first question? Thank you very much. Is it cancer? He said, I don't know. I've been doing this a long time. But he says this. It doesn't look good. The ride home was overwhelming. It was frightening. I remember having to call my parents and tell them, just crying on the phone. Later that afternoon, my wife had to pick up one of our sons from Atlanta Christian School. So I went upstairs. I laid on my bed. And I decided to have a conversation with God. And I reminded God of all the good things that I've done for him. I had been pastoring for close to 30 years at that point. Given my life to Christ at a young age. I've been serving him through high school and college. By the way, I'm a graduate of Southeastern. Thank you very much. Uh, 1992. Many, many years ago. Um, so I'm, I'm having this conversation with God and I'm telling him, about all the good things I've done. And then when, when I finally stopped speaking, God decided to speak. And isn't that true, church? Listening is a lost art. If you listen for God, he is always speaking. It's the question is, are you listening? And so as I'm listening to God, I'm just wanting to hear from him. He didn't speak to me verbally. It wasn't a loud voice. It was just in my heart. And he said this, Psalm 118.17. And I went, well, I'm a pastor, and I know there's 150 psalms. But I don't know, because some of the psalms are really short. Does Psalm 118 even have verse 17? I grabbed my phone. I looked it up, and this is what it said. I will not die, but live and proclaim what the Lord has done. Yeah. 
Can I tell you the morning crowd didn't clap, but I like this crowd. I like this crowd. Thank you. I was speechless. I knew right then and there I wasn't going to die. And the test came back. It was cancer. My wife and I chose Fox Chase up in Philly and found out that it worsened it worse than what we expected. Because colon cancer in and of itself is very curable. But when it spreads, it becomes dangerous. And usually it spreads to your liver. And the worst case is it spreads to your lung. I had all three. Stage four colon cancer. There's only one stage after that. It's stage five, which is chemo until you die. Stage four. Colon, liver, and lung. Go big or go home. I immediately started chemo. I did six rounds. And then I had colon and liver surgery. Doctors told me that the tumor in my colon was in the perfect spot, which I give praise to God. And then they said this. The cancer was all over your liver, but after six rounds of chemo, it's only on one side, the side that we can take. And I don't know if you know this, but your liver is the only organ in your body that regenerates. So they took 60% of my liver. Six weeks later, I have lung surgery. There's a spot on the bottom of my right lobe, and they took that out. The bottom of my right lobe is gone. And they go in the hospital to give me Tylenol. And I'm like, listen, you can't give me Tylenol. I just had liver surgery six weeks ago. They tested my liver, functioning at 100%. February 2nd, cancer diagnosis. October 4th, cancer-free. Isn't that incredible? I wish the story ended there, but it doesn't. I like, I like this reaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nine months later, you know, I don't know how you, if you've ever been with somebody who, who has cancer. They scan every three months, especially early on. So... I had scans in October and in January, and just every three months I had scans. And August was coming, and I was supposed to scan. And the week before I had a scan, God gave me a vision. Now, I don't have visions, but I know this was real. And this vision was me back in the chemo room, and I was praying for people. I was laying hands on people, and I was praying for them. And the Lord said this to me in the, in the vision. Will you glorify me in the chemo room? I didn't tell my wife. I was hoping God was just testing me. The next week I had scans and there was spots in my lungs, about four or five spots, inoperable spots in my lungs. And my doctor said to me, listen, he said, we could do pills or we could just monitor this. He said, you could do intense chemo if you want. And I said, I'm doing intense chemo. And I remember my wife just looking at me like, are you crazy? And I told her the vision. She's crying. I'm crying. My doctor's crying. We just had a God moment. And I went back in that chemo room for 12 more rounds. And I met 16 people that I shared the gospel with, that I prayed with. It was amazing. Was it difficult? Yes. Am I still battling it? Yes. Hence the hair, which will be gone real soon. Last Monday, not this past, but the one day before, I had my 46th round of chemo. Tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., I have number 47. I have nine more. I appreciate your prayers. I will end in June. We will scan. What happens is when I'm not on chemo, the spots grow. And then I end up scanning and going back on chemo for 12 rounds. And then my hair grows back. Come on, somebody. My hair grows back, and then I, get, I lose it all again. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, Will. Sorry, Ben. But I know this. Through all of this, God has been glorified. God has been glorified. And I'm not telling you this so that I get any glory because it's all about the Lord. I've been able to do my chemo rounds on Monday so that I can preach on Sundays. I've only missed a few Sundays in six years because God is good. But see, now you know my story. What's your story? Because there are people here. There are people watching online. There are people at our Cumberland County location that know pain and suffering. And pain and suffering isn't just cancer. It's not just sickness and disease. It's depression and anxiety and family issues and marital struggles and divorce and losing a loved one or a child. It's a failed business. We've all been in pain and suffering. So what do you do with pain and suffering? What do you do with it? 
Especially if you're a Christ follower today and you know there's a God who can make your suffering end in a moment. How do you deal with that? I want to, for the next couple of minutes, just give you five things that I've learned through suffering. Five things that impacted my life as I look back over these past six years of what suffering has taught me. Here's the first thing. Well, before we do that, let me just say this. There's one statement I want to make, if you could put it up. Suffering doesn't have to define you. That's really important. Um, in, the morning, in the morning session, I shared this with the, with the church that, um, listen, I pastor in Pleasantville. I love feedback. And so if I say something good like this, you can say amen. And uh, I'll share this with you because I want you to do this. I was in a church in Atlantic City doing a, doing a revival. Come on, somebody. Right? And uh, it was an African-American church, and they were rocking. And I got up to preach, and I preached my heart out. And there was this older black woman that sat over here. And every time I said something good, she'd say, tell it. <laughs> so when I say something good today, can you do me a favor and just say, tell it. <laughs> tell it. And I can, we can hear you, Cumberland County. Just say it loud. If you're online, do it on the side. Give us a tell it if it's something good. And could you do me a favor? Next week when Brendan, Pastor Brendan gets back, in the middle of one of his good points, could you just scream, tell it, tell it. Listen, we won't tell him. It'll be our secret. Okay? All right, here we go. Five things I've learned in suffering. Five things. Here's the first one. In suffering, God gives you his very best, his presence. There's nothing greater than that statement right there, that his presence is important. Now, many of you don't know me, but I grew up in church. I, I, I cut my teeth on the pews. Anybody else grew up in church, like from a young age? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, so you know, I grew up in church, and I heard this story many times about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you know the story? Daniel chapter 3, it's a fantastic story. There's this crazy king came named, named Nebuchadnezzar. And he's like, listen, I made a huge golden image. Every time the music plays, would you just do me a favor and bow down and worship this idol? And so everybody's bowing except for these three boys, these three young men, these Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're like, listen, yeah, we're not bowing down. We only bow down to God. The king finds out. He brings them in. He's like, listen, guys, I like you, but uh, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. Look, Daniel 3, verse 17. This is their response. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So the king is so furious, he's like, listen, tie him up, throw him in the furnace. Do you know what happens? It's incredible. There's not three people in the furnace. There's four. Because God himself meets them in their worst pain and suffering. His presence. He didn't have to deliver them. He didn't have to go into the furnace with them. He could have just had them dancing around and having a good time in the fiery furnace. But he chose, come on, he chose to get in it with them. Do you know that God is in your suffering? That God is in your pain? Look at this verse, verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet, leaped to his feet, whatever that word is in amazement, and asked his advisors, weren't there three men we tied up and threw in the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And this is the best way he can describe God. He says, and the fourth looks like the sons of God, of a God. That fourth person is almighty God. And I want you to know, church, this morning, that in your suffering, that in your pain, God is with you. He gives you his very best, his presence. There is nothing greater. And if you have his presence, hear me, friends. You can get through it. You can overcome. Here's, here's the second thing I learned. Suffering reminds us that we're not in control. Now, we had a wonderful response early in the early service. Um, where are my control freaks? Just raise it up, like, like proudly, like I have to be in control. We see you online. We see you in Cumberland County. We know who you are. Listen, I am a control freak. I am a card-carrying member, like for real. Um, my wife and I went to Tennessee last summer on vacation. I drove the whole way. 
there and back. She's like, honey, you want me to drive? Not a chance. I'm good. I'm good, man. I am in control. I love to be in control. But you know what? Pain and suffering teaches you this. Teaches you, this. you are not in control. You are not in control. God is the one in control. And listen, I can't control chemo. I can't control my body's response to chemo. I can't control cancer, but God can. God's in control. He knows. And listen, I can't control much, and neither can you, but God. There's a man in the Bible named Job. Do you know Job's story? If you get a chance this week, read Job 1 and 2. It's fantastic. I just want to hide a little bit of Job's life. Verse, one, or verse 2 and 3 says this. It gives you a little bit about Job's, what he had. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys. He had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. That last statement's huge. Job had it all. And Satan believed, because Satan and God had a conversation about Job. And Satan believed that Job only served and worshipped God because of all the stuff he had. And God said, take it away from him. And Satan did in a moment. If you read the story, I don't have time to read it. But if you read the story, one servant after another begins to come to Job and say, a raiding party came and your camels are gone. Your flocks are gone. Your, your, your children are gone. They were in a house together. The house collapsed. They all died. Servant after servant comes to him and said, you have lost it all. And look at Job's response, verse 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will, I will, uh, I will go, I will depart. But listen, may the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. It says he worshiped God, that he praised God in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his worst pain, he gave praise to God because he knew he was not in control, that God was. And can I tell you, friends, one of the best things you can do in pain and suffering is to worship. Tomorrow at 7 a.m., I will be in the chemo chair. And for the next four hours, they will put unbelievable chemicals in my body and it will be a terrible thing and I will have a bad day. I will have a bad couple of days. But I'll tell you this. I have these headphones that I always take with me and I put them on. I go to my Spotify. Come on, somebody. I have my, I have my worship outline and I just hit play and for the next couple of hours, I will just worship God because he's worthy. One of the best things you could do in suffering and pain is to worship God. Because he's worthy and he's in control. Here's the third point. This is good. Listen, suffering moves your theology. Now, theology is just a big word for your belief and your trust in God. Suffering will move your theology. And here's the thing. It will either move it towards God or it will move it away from God. The choice is yours. It's your choice how you decide in pain and suffering what you will do. Through my journey these last six years, I've learned a lot. I've cried a lot. I've learned a lot. I've been through a lot of pain and suffering. And there's this verse that I came across in Romans that is just amazing. Listen to what it says. Romans 3, or excuse me, Romans 5, verse 3. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Watch this. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. Wait a minute. That's in the Bible? Yes. The Apostle Paul says we glory in our suffering because we know that suffering, watch what suffering produces. It produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. That's what's being produced in your suffering, in your pain. When you understand who God is and what he's doing and you don't go to God accusing God but inquiring of God, there's a big difference, church. Throughout this all, I've never accused God of anything. I've inquired, God, why are you doing this? God, I don't understand. But I've never accused God. Be careful not to accuse God. But we can inquire of him. 
And so the Apostle Paul says, we glory in suffering because, don't miss this, it's a tell it moment. Listen, listen. Certain things are only, only flourish in the soil of suffering. Do you understand that? There's certain things in your life that will only come about through suffering and pain. And God says, I am teaching you something. I am molding you. I am doing something great in your life through your pain, through your suffering. That's God. And so the choice is yours. Will you move your theology, your belief and trust in God in pain and suffering? Will you, will you lean into God? Or will you lean back and say, man, how can I serve a God I don't understand? Because you're not God. And there's a lot of things, man. I have great questions for God. And there's a lot of things I don't understand. But I know this. I trust him. I trust him completely. So we said this. In suffering, God gives us his presence. In suffering, we learn that we're not in control. And suffering either produces you towards God or away from God. Here's the fourth one. And this is the tell it. Come on, I want to hear it. This is the tell it. Suffering will end one day. Come on. Suffering will end one day. Revelation 21 says this. Listen, Jesus, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, mourning, crying, pain, cancer, suffering, whatever you want to add to that. For the old order of things have passed away. Listen, friends. There will be a point in my life, either in this side of eternity or next, where there will be no cancer. I am trusting and believing God that it will happen on this side of eternity. I thank God every day for my healing. And I believe it. But right now I'm going through it because there are people in that hospital. There are people that I do infusion with. There are nurses and doctors that I am witnessing to. Listen, I'm not bragging, but when I go to Fox Chase, man, I'm like the mayor up there. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you like it is. They're like, hey, Matt. Like, hey. Hey, Matt. Hey. I know the nurses by name. It's incredible. I mean, six years. So much death up there. So many times they don't get to see someone go through life. And I'm going through victorious because of who God is. <laughs> Suffering one day will end. Let me hear it from Cumberland County. Just say, tell it. Let's go. Let's go. Final thought. Here we go. Suffering opens doors. My suffering has allowed me to meet people I would have never met. It's allowed me to encourage many people, which I'm doing right now, online, another campus, here, first service, second service, third service, just encouraging people. I prayed for people in the chemo room. I've had the honor of sharing my story, my faith with others, prayed for them while they're hooked up to an infusion to accept Jesus. Incredible. This, is, this isn't about me. This is about God. And your suffering, your pain, God can bring glory because of who he is. Have you ever thought, just for a moment, that maybe your pain and suffering will open a door that was once shut? Because we don't want to think like that. But maybe what you're going through right now, or what you've been through, or what you're going to go through, Maybe God is opening a door that would have never been opened. I have had the opportunity to meet people I would have never meant. Meant. Listen, let me end with this. I'm going to tell you about Jane in just a minute, but we got to talk about our suffering Savior. You know, we don't usually put those two words together, do we? Glorious Savior, wonderful Savior. How about suffering Savior? Jesus suffered, and there's this, there's this mindset in church that says, you know what? Um, why should I have to suffer, man? God's on the throne. We live in a broken and fallen world. And there's suffering and pain. There's sickness, there's disease, there's death. It's terrible. But one day God's going to make it all right. And so our Savior suffered greatly. Hebrews 5, 6. I'm reading it out of the contemporary English version because I like what it says. Listen to this. God had the power to save Jesus from death. You do realize that. He didn't have to go out on a cross. He chose to because he loves us. And while Jesus was on earth, he begged God with loud crying and tears to save him. If you remember the story in the Garden of Gethsemane, what happens? He's sweating drops of blood. 
Our Savior suffered. He truly worshiped God and God listened to his prayers. And then in verse 8 it says this, and I love this. Listen, verse 8. He says, Jesus is God's own son, but still he had to suffer. He had to. And for some of us today, that's, that's our story. That we have to because of a broken and fallen world. But God wants to do something in your suffering. He suffered before he could learn what it really means to obey God. This next statement is incredible. Listen, Jesus was perfect from the beginning. But listen to the statement. Suffering, suffering made Jesus perfect. Because now we have a Savior who suffered. And so when we're suffering, we look to him. Because he's been through it. He knows. And now he can save forever all who obey him. Listen to this next statement because it's a tell it moment. And then I'm going to end with a story about Jane. Can you put it up, guys? Jesus' greatest suffering, which was the cross, was turned into the greatest victory of all, our salvation. Tell it. Tell it. So I have these infusions that I go to. And my nurses were telling this lady named Jane who was given just a couple months to live. You got to meet Matt. You got to talk to Matt. His story is incredible. And as God would have it, Jane and I ended up in infusion together. I said to my nurse, can I, can I move over there? She said, sure. So I pulled up next to Jane and I began to just share with her. She told me all that she's going through, all her pain, all her suffering, all her cancer. It's terrible. It's spreading. She has literally days to live. And I said, Jane, you were created for eternity. She started to cry. I said, there's a God who loves you, who died for you, and wants you in heaven with him. And I remember saying this to her, and people don't think like this, because I, I, I have the unfortunate opportunity to do funerals. And one of the things I always share at a funeral is, death is one-to-one. -one. You know, to win the New Jersey lottery, it's four million to one. But do you know the ratio of death? It's one to one. Nobody skips it. Nobody takes a pass. Everybody experiences it. And so, Jane, you need to be prepared. And she was crying. I got a chance to pray with her. The next week, I brought her a Bible. And we, we got our chairs next to each other again. And I grabbed her hand. And I said, Jane, you need Jesus. And she said, I'm ready. Right there. Right there in the infusion room. She accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. I texted her last night. She was in the hospital for a week. She hadn't eaten. When I say it's the end of life, it's the end of life for her. Last time I saw her a couple Fridays ago, she said, would you pray that God would take me home? I'm ready to go. And my last words to Jane were this. I will see you in heaven one day. And she said, you will. You will. Now, I want to close in just a minute, but can we put up that scripture one more time? Psalm 118, 17. Because this is what I'm standing on. I will not die but live and proclaim what God has done. It's not just for me. It's for you too. And so I did this first service and I want to do it again. And this is for uh, our Cumberland County location and even those watching online. Listen, if you're suffering right now, if you're in pain, if you're going through something that's difficult, would you stand so I can pray for you? I know it's a step of faith. But if you're suffering, if there's pain in your life right now, just stand. I want to pray for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We see you online. We see you at the other location. Just stand before God. Gracious God. Almighty God. Creator of all. You see these people that are standing to you. You see those people online. Lord, that are in pain and suffering. God, would you, in the midst of their pain and suffering, meet them? Would your presence overwhelm them? God, we realize we are not in control, that you are. And we surrender, we worship you, we honor you. Bless those that are suffering. God, help this message to be an encouragement to them that you are at work in suffering, that you are doing something great, that you're opening doors for people. We thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Would you all stand with me, please?